be Inequality first. What z greater than or equal to zero? What does that do? So, well, what do we mean positive? So it's on the xy plane or above. So we'll call it the upper half. And so we'll call it the upper half uh, cube or half cube. So our second property, our second uh, inequality is really two inequalities in disguise. So it's that x squared plus y squared plus z squared is both greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 3. So it's not a coincidence, I just talked about spheres a minute ago. These look a lot like spheres. <coughs> so let's take the small one first. So if I look at the uh, equality, What is the center of the sphere? Origin, zero, zero, zero. What is the radius? One, or square root of one. But So we have centered at zero, radius one. Now, <coughs> that's if we're equal. Now that would be really hard to shade in if you try to draw a sphere and then everything outside. If you do need to draw a sphere, Now if I want to draw the outside, the only thing I can really think of is trying to draw a bunch of arrows, but the problem is I can't really nicely draw, at least I can't draw arrows going towards us and away from us. So my art skill very quickly breaks down. So that's about the best I can do to describe the outside of a sphere. Okay, what about the other inequality? Similar. So the boundary is our sphere of radius. Is it radius 3? No, root, three. root 
So we have to be careful. So we're inside a sphere of radius square root 3. Uh, so our points are distance, um, our distance needs to be less than or equal to, or I should say our square distance if it's written like this, should be less than or equal to 3. So our distance needs to be less than or equal to square root 3 from the origin. Because the inequality flipped is the short answer to that question. So we're inside sphere, center at the origin. Radius square root 3. Now, because it doesn't go out forever, we can draw this. There's basically a small sphere and a big sphere. And the z condition means we're using the top half of the sphere. So we're basically cutting these spheres in half horizontally. And those are not too hard to draw. We're going to draw something really similar to the sphere that I drew before. But we're just going to draw the I recommend just draw a full, oh, that's not a good circle. Ooh, shapes. Let's see what, that's not a shape. At least for me, it's harder to draw a half circle than draw a full circle and erase half of it. And I'll try to dot the back. All right, so if this is a radius square root 3, there's another sphere inside of it, which I don't want to spend the time trying to get those perfectly lined up. So I'm just going to approximate the inside sphere. Looks like the little geology models of the Earth. <laughs> that right there on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. So that's basically what we're. All right, so there's our region. I will not be grading on drawing skills. So if you draw really well or really poorly, that won't really affect your grade. So it's about if you can describe the region and then write down the bounds carefully. So we're moving into vectors next. So you should remember pre-calculus was about one quarter of the class was pretty much vectors. So we'll really quickly review some of the things we went over there and then go quite a bit further into vector land than we did before. So vector is a directed line segment. easy to draw a vector. <laughs> you just draw an arrow. We'll use letters like U and V. Our vectors are going to generally live in three-dimensional space. Occasionally they'll be in two dimensions. So the way we write that vector, if it's a three-dimensional vector, it'll live in three-dimensional space. Or if we're in two dimensions, our vector will live in two-dimensional space. One dimensional vector is also known as a number. And a lot of things I show you uh, will work in higher dimensional spaces. Cross product is the only one thing on top of my head that doesn't work in higher dimensional spaces. So anything that I say with cross products won't make sense in higher dimensions. But most of the time, we're going to be working in three dimensions. 
All right. What do you do when you want to do a cross frag, but you're in a higher dimension? You don't. Okay. It doesn't make any sense. There may be some other product operations in there, dot products in every dimension. So if you can get away with using the dot product in other ways, uh, then you do that. So we'll go vector from a point to another point. So we'll write it um, A, B with a little arrow over top of it, and that means the vector going from A to B. So visually, it's a vector with A at the beginning and B at the end. And how do I get this vector if I know A and B? You subtract B from A. There we go, B minus A, N minus start. So that's not just something that's useful in Calc 2. That is useful pretty much anytime you want to find the difference of two things. All you do is subtract them. You do need to know end versus start. What happens if you switch the two around? If you do start minus end? You'll get a negative. You'll get a negative, so your arrow will go the opposite direction. So you'll be pointing the opposite way. So that's how we do a uh, vector from a point to a point. Magnitude. also known as modulus or length. So the way we write it down, it looks just like absolute value. And if you're in three dimensions, so if your vector is, uh, let's go with ABC as the components, uh, the modulus will be square root A squared plus B squared plus c squared. So this is in R3. And of course, back in two dimensions, in R2, uh, we'll go with u. So if u is in R2, there's only two coordinates, a and b. So magnitude u is just square root a squared plus b squared. So we have a theorem, the magnitude of a vector is zero exactly when the vector is zero. Now you have to be careful when you talk about vector, a vector being zero. So I don't mean the vector is the number zero. What do I mean when I write down the vector is zero? What type of zero? The magnitude is zero. Well, so I do have the magnitude of zero over here, but here I actually mean the vector is zero, but I don't mean the number zero. So it'll be the zero vector. So for in three dimensions, it'll be zero, zero, zero. For in two dimensions, it'll be zero, zero. So the way we write down the zero vector, you just make a really bold zero. So just loop around three times or so. That'll make it bold enough. So exactly when v equals zero. So this is the zero vector. And the zero either is zero, zero, zero. Or if you're in two dimensions, this zero vector is just zero, zero. Of course, if you're in four dimensions, it's zero, 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 zero. It's whatever dimension that the vector lives in. All right, so if the length is zero, you know that the vector has to be zero itself. So the, the uh, less than or uh, greater than? Uh, oh, I didn't talk about those yet. So that's notation. So the way I write vectors, so if you see A, B, C with parentheses, this means a point. So points use parentheses when I write them. And if you see uh, diamond brackets, this is a vector. So I use diamond brackets 
for vectors. I like diamond brackets because in my mind, I think of, oh, it's like an arrow. So that's why I use diamond brackets. You can technically treat a point like a vector and vice versa because they each have three coordinates. So you can do whatever you do to vectors, you can treat a point that way. But uh, usually we use points to denote a location in space and a vector as a way to get from one to another. So they're treated differently. So I want to find a vector and its magnitude from one point to another. So our first point will be negative three, four, one. The second point will be negative five, two, two. So we're going from A to B. It would be a waste of time to plot out A and B in three dimensions. So don't worry about where A and B are in three dimensions. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter for this. You just want to go B minus A. So do the subtraction, and then compute the magnitude afterwards. So do that right now. You have to show work for everything. Well, at least tell me it was you got it from B minus A, and you didn't just write down three numbers like your lottery picks or something like that. No, I need to know where. At least you need to tell me that. Yeah, I wrote that. Okay. I just didn't write that. You can skip that step right there. Or if you skip B minus A, you should at least you should write one of the two. Oh, look at that, Pythagorean quadruple, I think that would be called. Three numbers squared added together gives you uh, another perfect square. Why did I not bother with the negatives in front of the twos on my magnitude? Because it's square anyways. So I'm going to square them out. So chances are, if you include your negatives, more, more times than not, I see people not squaring the negatives to be positive. So I recommend if you're going to find a magnitude, just don't even bother writing the negatives inside. Make sure you're adding three positive numbers. There should be no subtraction in a magnitude. So next up, we're going to look at addition and scalar multiplication. do addition first. So we'll take V1 to be A1, B1, C1. V2 will be A2, B2, C2. If you're writing just for yourself, you're not turning something in for credit, you can skip writing commas if you can make sure that there's space in between. If you skip writing commas, what would be dangerous? For example, if I don't write commas, and let's say my vector is 1, 12, 15. If I don't write commas, that's very ambiguous right there. So if you decide to skip writing commas, 
that would not be a good way to write the vector down. If you're going to skip writing commas on this vector, you want to be very intentional about your spacing. So that would be very bad. So if you're going to use spaces to, instead of commas, make sure it's really obvious where your spaces are. I recommend against it, but occasionally I might skip writing spaces, or skip writing commas, especially if I have subscripts going on. It's kind of a pain to come back and do that. So it's up to you how you want to write it. I'll try to write with commas when I can. All right, so addition, v1 plus v2. All you do is add up the x's, add up the y's, add up the z's. Now here's a great time to use commas. So that is addition. And scalar multiplication is next. So we're going to use scalars. Uh, we'll generally use letters, uh, Greek letters alpha and beta. So when your elements are vectors, we use the word scalars for real numbers. Now, a more general way to think about scalars is basically the types of elements that are in each spot of your vector. So we have vectors that have real numbers inside of them, so our scalars are real numbers. If I had vectors that had complex entries, my scalars would be complex numbers. What would happen if we mix and match? Uh, then you wouldn't have a, vectors have to be, uh, you have to have the same type of, technically you need a field in each of these, which is a ring with an inverse. But you don't have to worry about, well, it's more than just that, but you have to put the same type in each spot in a vector, or else you don't have, you have something different. Because it wouldn't make sense to uh, do certain operations if you didn't have the same type of number in each spot. So our scalars are going to be real numbers. So if we do alpha v1, that'll be alpha times a1, b1, c1. All you do is distribute. So I want to find the magnitude of 17 times this vector right here. So this looks like a really unfun problem to do. So let's first of all, <coughs> did I tell you how to do a magnitude of scalar products? Nope, you only know how to do magnitude of a vector. So let's go ahead and do that. I did tell you how to distribute your scalar. So let's do that first. No calculators allowed. <laughs> All right, I don't need a calculator yet, right? So squ uh, square each of these, add them together under a square root. Now I'm going to skip writing negatives because I know squaring is going to make them positive. Now, some of you might be tempted to square 17 or use a calculator to square 17. 
I don't have to square 17. What can I do instead? Multiply by 3. You can't just multiply by 3. It's highly illegal. Factor out the 17. So we're going to factor out. So these are all 17 squared times 2 squared. So if I write that, 17 squared times 2 squared plus, I don't really need to write the 1 squared, but I'm going to do it anyways. Now it should be really clear I can factor out 17 squared. And what can I do here? Do 17 outside the square root. So 17 is outside the square root. And then I just have 4 plus 1 plus 9. 14, square root 14. Do you know calculator necessary? All right, so what did we learn? We learned basically how to bring a uh, scalar product outside of a magnitude. So to summarize this, what we just saw, magnitude of alpha v, what we got, it was alpha times the magnitude of our vector. We still had the magnitude of the vector to compute. Now you need to be a little careful. Our alpha was positive. If I chose negative 17, I would have ended up with positive 17 outside, not the negative 17. So there's another absolute value around the coefficient. Our coefficient was positive, so I didn't have to worry about that. But if it was negative, it would come out as positive. Could you have, uh, I guess, multiply all out and then take the square root and all the same answer? Yeah, they're equal. So you can do it. says that's, that's what this tells you. Oh, that's what you can either find the magnitude of the scaled vector or find the unscaled magnitude multiplied by the absolute value of the scale. So they're the same thing. Next example, let's keep it in two dimensions this time. We'll go with the vector u is 3, 1. And v is 4, 7. Make sure u's don't look like your v's. My v's don't have a sharp point on them, but my u's have a foot. So make sure on your paper, your U's don't look like your V's. Unlike in math or in English, where you can read the word that you've written and then figure out if that's a U or a V pretty clearly, that doesn't work when you write math, because you don't write enough letters to figure it out in context. So I want to do a few operations. Let's go 3U minus 2V. And go ahead and compute that right now. You have a choice to distribute your negative inside your vector when you subtract, or leave it outside and then subtract the entire vector. And it doesn't matter which of the two ways you go, you should get to the same uh, vector. So this was an arithmetic example. Let's look at the algebraic rules. Algebra does rule. 
even in calculus class. So we have three vectors, and there'll be an n-dimensional space, and we'll have two scalars, alpha and beta, are real numbers. So first addition property we have is commutative property, u plus v equals v plus u. What would you get if you added a vector to the zero vector? Zero. Just the u. Just the u. So add zero, it's like adding nothing, as it works here. Now, when I write zero next to a u, what operation am I thinking of? Multiplying everything by zero. Multiplying by zero. Is that zero the number or zero the vector? Number the vector. It's the number. So it's a scalar. So you should be able to tell if you're looking at zero if it's a vector or a number, not necessarily by if it's bold or not, by what it's doing. So you can only uh, multiply a vector by a scalar. So if it's a vector multiplied by zero, it's got to be the number zero. So zero u equals the zero vector. Correct. So that's why I'll put, I am being extra careful with zero, like which zero is which. So the number zero times the u is the zero vector. And we can change the uh, associativity of scalars. So alpha times beta u is alpha times beta times u. Or you can write it. Nope, that's really the only way to reassociate. Well, I could actually use a commutative property of multiplication over scalars as well. Let's not worry about that. Too many properties to write down. All right, two numbers added together gives me another scalar. How do you think this should behave? What property would be nice to have? Distributive, distributive property. And distributive property works here too. So it's alpha u plus beta u. That's the distributive one way. There's the distributive the other way, meaning if you have a scalar multiplied by a sum of vectors, this is alpha u plus alpha v. So it distributes both ways. Those are different. One of them has two scalars, the other one has two vectors, except it distri distributes in a very similar way. We have associativity with vector addition. What about u plus negative u? What should that equal? Zero. zero. What's zero? The number or the vector? vector. The vector. So if you Perform addition or subtraction on vectors, you better get another vector. So it's zero, the vector zero. Now we have the number one times u. What should that equal? It should equal u. So that's what we call the identity, the uh, multiplicative identity. But in this case, it would be the scalar or multiplicative identity. And last, oh, we already did that last one. So that's the end of our properties. Is it too much to ask, or should I know this? Like, can you run that by me? I'm just kind of confused about when is a vector and a scalar. Like, it just seems like zero is being multiplied by a letter, and then you're getting like a letter, or you're getting like a number, and like what? So if you add a vector, it can only be added to another vector. Okay. You can't add a vector and a number, which is why uh, u plus the number zero doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But then how do you know that it's a, that zero is a vector or a scalar? Because if, so this one, th if this zero was a number, it wouldn't make any sense. Because u plus zero is 
just you. Because it, it's a number. It, well, I, I didn't, I don't know how to add numbers to vectors. Oh. Like, if I can write it down, what, what in the world am I talking about here? I don't know. Do I add five to the three, to the two, to both, to neither? Okay. I have no so idea. How did you know that, that was equal to you? Because then you didn't do anything with the vector. So, uh, so let's look at that. So if we have, th that's the one you want to look at, right? So let's go. Yeah, I feel like that will answer some of the other stuff. Okay. So, what zero vector in this case am I referring to? So it'll be the zero, zero. It has to match dimensions. So let's add these two together. And we get three plus zero is three. And two plus zero is two. So adding a zero vector has no effect. So that's why u plus zero equals u is what you started with. And that, that zero was a vector? Yes. And, and then the bottom one. We can see that that was, no, no, sorry, the one right below the one we were working on. We can see that that zero is a scalar, right? Because it's not bold. Yes. In addition to that, uh, it doesn't make sense yet to multiply a vector times a vector. I didn't tell you how to do that yet. So on that one, we just have to trust you on that one. Well, it's not a question of trust. I haven't, you can't multiply a vector times a vector. There are some products that we will look at, but, but none of them are just a regular product. There's a cross product and a dot product, neither of which are regular multiplication. So if I have a dot in between, I mean a dot product. And if I have a small x in between, I mean a cross product. You can't multiply those together. You can't directly multiply vectors, no. If you're thinking about vector multiplication, you're thinking about the dot product or the cross product, most likely, or some other product that I'm not thinking of at the moment. So that example that we did, the first example, that was not like a multiplication, no? that the 17 was not a vector or something? It's a number. It was just a number? Yeah, if it was a vector, it would have been wrapped in, in the square brackets, and it probably would have had at least one comma in it. OK, so you can multiply a scalar with a vector and get a vector back. Correct. Okay. So it's a little tricky because you're going to multiply or add, and you have to pay attention to what types you're adding or multiplying together. Um, I don't know if it's a pre-calculus 2 homework question, but on one web work assignment, I asked basically, does it, do these operations make sense on these objects? I don't think I put that in Calc 3. but. Uh, if you're struggling, I strongly recommend do all the example problems out of the book, the ones that they explain at the beginning of the section. So don't just go to the practice examples or practice questions at the end. And I know it's been a while since you took pre-calculus too, which is why we're going through this relatively carefully, but I can't spend too much time on it. That'd be kind of cool.